this is Robert Stark. I'm joined here with uh, filmmaker uh, Jim Van Beber. Jim, great having you on. Thanks. And I'm also joined here with my uh, co-host, uh, Pill Eater. Hi, Robert. Hi, Jim. It's good to be on. Nice to say hi to you. Yep. Jim, can you talk about how you got started with uh, filmmaking and directing? Your first film was uh, Deadbeat at Dawn. Uh, yeah, my first feature film. I mean, um, I started uh, making films on regular 8mm when I was a kid. I started at 11 and uh, made films throughout high school, and they would get more ambitious and longer in length. And it was a 40-minute film um, that I made my senior year that actually got me a scholarship to Wright State University Film School. And uh, I studied, uh, you know, there for a couple of years, learned 16 millimeter, met two guys uh, that were um, studying there, Marcelo Gomez and Mike King. And, um, you know, we all went and saw The Evil Dead and said, you know, if those fuckers from Michigan can pull that off, we can too. So we went for it, you know, but it was me. Uh, I dropped out, you know, third year and uh, I kicked it off, you know, and made sure, you know, pushed it through. I always feel like sometimes maybe I should drop from college just to publish my novel, but I spent like an extra year and a half just to get my degree and I'm kind of kind of almost there and i always feel like maybe it might be worth my time but i always feel like it's it's up to the individual you know you gotta you gotta you know look into the future and see you know is it going to be worth your time and money to have a degree and is that really going to help you or is it having a piece of work going to help you you know i mean what's your vocation what are you doing you know it's uh it's everybody's own decision for me you know especially Wright State, which um, was headed up at that time by not really filmmakers. I mean, uh, the head of the department was more of a theorist, and he was more, um, he just wanted to turn all the students into good film critics. You know, <laughs> and I was like, uh, excuse me, this is called motion picture production. And um, so... You know, it depends on who, uh, you know, your teachers are, where you're at. Um, to me, you know, I knew a, a degree from Wright State University was worthless um, compared to having, um, you know, a completed uh, feature film. So I've learned how I to just, uh, like I've learned how yeah. to read and write in school. And so that's one thing I feel like I can do. But I feel like, yeah there's some other things where it's like you really don't need to spend like a hundred thousand dollars and to go to an institution to do things what you love so well you know unless uh you get lucky and it's uh uh nyu in um the late 70s and martin scorsese you're a film professor uh most of these guys are guys that uh you know wanted to make films but ended up uh, realizing that they you know couldn't couldn't do it or couldn't compete or didn't want to and they turned to something safe which is teaching you know not to knock teaching i mean i like teachers and you know uh friends of mine filmmakers like buddy giovanazzo he taught for years at the school of visual arts in new york so i mean so does roy frumke's uh you know i'm not knocking it i'm just saying like uh you know my situation mm-hmm you're from Ohio, yeah. and a lot of your most of your films take place in Ohio. Can you talk about like some of the factors that about about Ohio that influence your film? And I, I think Ohio is important to bring up because it was also a crucial s state in the last election. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I've, uh, you know. Uh, the Midwestern area around there, uh, Iowa, Indiana, you know, uh, Ohio, whatever, the Midwest, um, has a, a certain ethic um, where um, just like to see things get done. And I mean, it's not, it's uh, not really a film 
or art oriented uh, place. And so I don't know. I mean, if anything, it made you work harder to try and uh, make something fantastical to uh, escape, you know, the um, the mindset. Um, I don't know. As far as uh, Trump's victory, you know, with Ohio, and um, I just think uh, he speaks exactly to, you know, these kind of uh, solid work ethic. Um, Midwesterners, you know, who, you know, uh, don't have the, uh, glitz of either coast or, uh, the comfort of Washington or anything. And I mean, these are the people who, um, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. The main factories, uh, you know, um, and manufacturing plants have left in the last uh, 15 years. And, um, what point so, did it I really mean, get bad with the manufacturing jobs going overseas was it the 90s or did you even notice it in the 80s um no it was the 90s i mean it was after nafta you know it was uh, it was uh clinton's second term and then you know from there on out it slowly and then just a uh, wash you know and uh trump's you know i mean he sounded like uh, hyperbole, you know, in some of his rallies saying, you know, this is our last chance because, uh, you know, we can't take another four years. And that's not hyperbole. I mean, he's dead right. I, re I remember going to a, a Trump rally in uh, Westchester and uh, I was actually quite surprised of the crowd there. I know most of the media will often say that it's uh, a dangerous place or some kind of ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. Because what and, I, mean, I mean, dangerous only for the bust in out of uh, town protesters that the Democratic, uh, you know, party hired uh, sometimes for fifteen hundred dollars a pop to cause violence. I mean, the whole shit that happened in Chicago and elsewhere and uh, these protests now, those are all organized uh, George Soros money. It's the same thing as Black Lives Matter and it's uh, move on dot org. I mean, these people, they're not for real. And uh, they don't even vote. Like, it's fucking ridiculous. And people can't see through that. And the media won't report on what they really are and what they're really doing because they're in on it. They're being, you know, puppet master controlled by um, uh, people who invested heavily in the presidency of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because everyone at the place I went to, there was like, zero protesters basically all the main like the news media was around 50 people who didn't like trump but everyone else supposedly it was like seven thousand people all were pro-trump and i was amazed i was like wow i didn't realize how many like people like trump it's like people are scared to say they like trump in the workplace but when they go out and they gather people become honest and there's something really strange happening there where there's this secret uh community or consciousness of people in america not known before until they go to a trump rally oh well, yeah and um you know and i mean that was just it was so evident during the campaign i mean hillary would have two three hundred people show up and trump would have thirty five thousand. and then you know you look at the polls and it's like well hillary's nine points ahead and i'm like bullshit that's just bullshit and i mean even if it's not a skewed poll which a lot of them were I think in a lot of cases, you know, the phone rings, the family's fucking sitting around, and, uh, you know, somebody picks up a phone, and some stranger says, who are you voting for? And Trump's got this stigma, you know, and they, they know they're going to vote for Trump, but they're going to tell a stranger on the fucking phone, oh, Hillary, <laughs> you know, so give me a fucking I, break, man. I, you know, I did that. Like, I did that with uh -huh. Sanders. Somebody said, are you going to vote for the primaries? Are you going to vote for Sanders? I'm like, oh, well, yeah. Um, I went on the site. I read, I went to the, then I went, then I voted for Trump. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, I was really invested in uh, this election and I wanted Trump to run last time, to tell you the truth. I've been a big fan of his uh, since, uh, I don't know, about eight years ago when I started reading his books. And, um, He's just an amazing man, and uh, he really has accomplished incredible things um, through force of personality. 
and um, and he's so smart and such a negotiator. And uh, I always knew he'd be he, he's going to be so fantastic for the United States. I mean, it's not even, and we're seeing it already. Trump, or I mean, Obama was mocking him um, three, two months ago, you know, about uh, carrier air conditioners in Indiana, and you know, going, well, how's he going to get the jobs back? You know, what's he going to do? They already left, and that's already been proven. Uh, you know, the guys have realized who's going to be president, and they're keeping at least half of the workforce in Indiana now, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. And no one in politics has been talking about this, anyone major, since, like, uh, Ross Perot ran in the 90s. Yeah, uh, Perot, unfortunately, uh, he probably would have been a damn good president, but he didn't have the personality. He was a, you know, uh, unpleasant-sounding, short old man, and uh, it didn't work. Trump's a big orange giant who's, you know, a billionaire. He's like fucking uh, Bruce Wayne or something. You know, I mean, he's a, he is Batman. So it works uh, for a lot of people on a lot of different levels. But anyway, I was just going to say, you know, as soon as he announced, I was, I was supporting him at least the way that I can on Facebook, you know, like, anything he uh got in front of the cameras and then with his rallies i made sure to send him out to uh the limited amount of people that look at you know my facebook page or whatever i wanted to make sure everybody knew where i stood and yeah you're i mean you're an independent uh filmmaker and even then there's still going to be issues but if you were in hollywood uh being coming out publicly for trump could be a Oh, yeah. Good. No, yeah. I would have been in a very, very, very small minority. I know how they think out there. And, yeah, it would have just been gross. It would have been, well, that's the way it is out there with everything. I mean, um, they have no sense of criticism or critique. To them, something's good if it made a lot of money. You know, everything's based on money and, and so-called liberal um, cachet. The, you know, you're you're just down with... Uh, all the quirks of uh, human neurosis and uh, it's all cool. And that's some of the people in the Midwest don't put up with. And uh, certainly, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had a small group of friends when I was in Hollywood and, you know, let me put it that way. So your first uh, featured film, uh, Deadbeat at Dawn, uh, that was actually uh, filmed in a Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I mean, I usually think of a date in Ohio as being a small city, but it does from it does have a very like a gritty like urban feel that you get from a lot of films that were filmed in like uh, New York and Chicago in the seventies and eighties. Well, you know, we we tried hard for that because uh, we tried to make Dayton look much more menacing than it is. Or Did was. it take place in Dayton or just a film there? Well, I, you know, I said it in Dayton. You know, it's referenced in the film, um, just like uh, in My Sweet Satan and whatever. I, you know, when I was there, it's like wherever I'm at, that's kind of where I make films about. <laughs> I've been in Florida for a while here, and so, you know, I was trying to get a, a alligator film off the ground. We ended up uh, shooting a 15-minute segment anyway, Gator Green. The film reminds me of... Um... You know, watching old movies, I kind of there's this aesthetic now to like the whole VHS culture background, where your your uh, Deadbeat at Dawn is kind of like this uh, old school violent solder house, you know, where it's like it's almost comical in a sense. Were were you actually trying to put some comedy in the film, or was this actually just a serious piece of artwork? I, no, I I think uh, you know it's it's got a real comic book feel. I mean, it has a surreal. I hope a hyper surreal feel, and there's elements of comedy in there, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's just sort of absurd on its face. Um, uh, a gang that carries golf clubs, you know. I mean, uh, a, a YouTube. Just once you stick, <laughs> you know, once you look at it. <laughs> But, you know, you play it dead serious, you know, and um, it, it works, um, you know, like what I, I wanted it to 
feel like uh, an old American International Pictures film, you know, from uh, Arkoff and James Nichols, you know, from the uh, late 60s or early 70s. I wanted it to have that feel. And I think it does. That's interesting because um, when I was watching the film again online, there's this this YouTuber online. His name is uh, Sign Masochist. Uh, and it's he's not back up on YouTube, is it? Yeah, it's it's actually no. Uh, this guy who reviewed your film on YouTube. Oh, he, okay. Because people post it up there all the time, and it just pisses off uh, yeah. an independent filmmaker. You know, I'm like motherfuckers. <laughs> And I go after fucking Brad Pitt or somebody with some fucking money. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So they could donate to you or give you money. But <laughs> Sign Masochist, he compared the movie to video games like Street uh, Streets of Rage or Final Fight. But from my here, I, I don't know if you were interested in arcade fighting games, but to make that comparison. No, seems- no. I mean, you know, I mean, he's going to get, he's obviously a big video exactly. uh, gamer. Mm-hmm. So he's getting out of it what he gets out of it, you know, I mean. That's very postmodern. Uh, strange. You know, somebody who's uh, 20, 15 years older than I am uh, looks at it and goes, oh, West Side Story. So, you know, I mean, it's like whatever, you know, or <laughs> somebody my age, it goes, the Warriors, you know, and what, you know, it's it's a past, pastiche, uh, past, pastiche of a, uh, Sort of a lot of those elements. I mean, you know, you take the gang genre, and uh, it's just uh, there seems to be what I could do. You know, at the time, the budget. You know, so there seems to be also a philosophy in the the film. There's there's this one part where the guy says, "Ah, "I hate people, and people fuck with (laughs) me." That seems to be really deep, like misanthropic. Is there kind of a message about? Oh, kind of like, people. have you seen Richard Wollstonecraft's uh, Pearls Before Swine? Um, uh, yes. Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's um, a punk nihilism, I would say, throughout that film. Um, when I met Sam Raimi for the first time, he had uh, seen Deadbeat. I was surprised, but uh, he, he told me um, it was the first punk action film. And I I said, I'll take that. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, I think one of the, I kind of look at the film as a tragedy because at the end it's like he doesn't save his girlfriend and then he, this weird kaleidoscope ending happens. Like it's this kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it just seems like it doesn't belong in there that the ending with the credits coming in, but it's like, it's strange because it's like the movie, as it as you say, it, it's like this punk action film. But like again, with the whole philosophy of being hating people, and it's almost sad as if uh, the guy failed to do his mission to save, or he did get his revenge, but he he goes out too. Yeah, well, when uh, he's fighting with his girlfriend early in the first reel, she says something like, I don't want you out there in the street bleeding to death or something like that. And so, of course, that's what how it's going to end. Oh. You know? <laughs> I'm more positive I think it's going to end happy. I gave you some foreshadowing. Come on, man. <laughs> well, the thing with the film is, uh, like, Hollywood films always like have to have a happy ending with the the only exception I think is like horror film. The horror genre is like the one exception where you can get away with a bad ending. It's almost kind of like if you're directing a Hollywood film, you're almost kind of obligated to have a happy ending. Yeah. The, the, um, the studios or whoever's paying for it is certainly going to uh, want you to do that. There was a golden age of nihilism in the early 70s where films were allowed to end on a bummer. I think everybody was just so bummed out about Vietnam and stuff. They just, they had a cheap look at life, you know. And so you had great endings where your heroes died. Um, Movies like Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, Vanishing Point. um, Who'll Stop the Rain, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a, you, you look at films made between like 69 and 74, and there's, it was not uncommon to have uh, downbeat endings. 
And, uh, you know, I was going to see all these films. They were very uh, seminal for me because I was a kid, you know. I was like seven, eight years old watching some of this shit. And I, I thought, you know, this is great. That's right. You know, fuck happy endings. You know, you get that on TV. You go to the movies and you walk out bummed out. That's awesome. Do you know of a uh, Donald F. Glut? Glut? Yeah, Glut. Blah. I, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. know of him. I've never met the man. Yes. I, I first found out when I had the Empire Strikes Back novelization. I really liked it mm-hmm. so much. Looked it up, and I like his films. I like his old school uh, Spider-Man, yeah, yeah. Superman films, and uh, I was just no, watching I've seen, that. Uh, I've seen that disc. I was a teenage filmmaker, or whatever. Gr- yeah, I love that, that film. Yeah, it's a great yeah. collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, you directed the Manson Family, so this actually uh, uh, took you uh, ten years to make. Can you talk about like what originally got you interested in uh, Charles Manson? in the project and the project well i think uh people my age we had a real fascination with manson um because we were of that age uh very impressionable when the 1977 or 79 i can't remember which year uh a tv movie of uh, an adaption of vince uh, Bugliosi's novel Helter Skelter uh, was made for CBS and it was a two night event on CBS and that just sort of that was it was a big deal for TV back there in the 70s it was kind of like uh, Roots or some you know it was a, a watershed moment for as far as ratings and you know uh, subject matter and um, then I guess really, I you know I was finishing up Deadbeat at Dawn, and then uh, me and Mike King, uh, the producer, cinematographer Mike is, um, we were watching. Uh, Geraldo Rivera had a two-hour special on television called Murder America or some sort of thing, and uh, the interview that he piecemealed out throughout the two hours that kept everybody staying with the whole program was his interview that he had just done with Charles Manson, where Manson just danced rings around Geraldo, made him look like the idiot that he is. I mean, not that I'm a fan of Charles Manson, but, I mean, and I was just like, you know, this is fascinating. Charlie really is fascinating. Nobody, you know, Helter Skelter was good, but that was more about the trial. I was like, you know, maybe we should do, really get into it and show what led up to the murders, you know, what was the scene like, you know, on the ranch. And once I got into the fucking research, that was the, it was like stepping into a liberate tar pit, you know, it's just, I got deeper and deeper and just had to keep going and shooting went off and on from 88 to 92. And then finally I was all shot. And then it was just like raising money to get the film developed and then ran a steam back to cut it on. I mean, that thing was cut on film, you know, um, finished on film. Uh, and then like, uh, you know, in 97, I had like a, uh, a rough cut that was on a beta SP that we had transferred it. And that showed at the fan Asia film festival in Montreal in 97 and that got a big buzz but it wasn't until i was in la and met up with david gregory and uh carl daft that they came in as uh partners and uh we got the film finished the way i wanted which was uh blown up to 35 and you know got a theatrical small art house theatrical around 22 cities but um it was uh, it was very um, satisfying to see the film uh, after you know just sticking it out and holding out because a lot of people wanted me just to finish it on DVD and just shoot it out there and I'm like you know this is this one's important <laughs> yeah, damn it and uh, I think uh, I've been proven right certainly this the most thing successful is... thing I've done. The film it released about uh, ten years ago, but it, it, it's able to sort of capture the feel uh, feeling on that it could have been made in like the seventies or eighties. Yeah, I think Deadbeat feels that way too. You know, it's kind of a well. Deadbeat actually was made in the eighties, but you know, I actually had a it, 
positive feelings from uh, the Manson family because I, I think of it more of um, it's not a, a sex exploitative film, but ugh, like I look at it more as like porn with the violence. Do you think of well, that? Well, sort of in the sense like where the knife becomes the penis. <laughs> okay, well. You know, all I knew was, like, if you do the research, I mean, sex was the big draw of getting people to join up with the family. I mean, that was for the guys especially. You know, they're like, fuck yeah, we'll hang out with Charlie and bring him drugs because we get, you know, our pick of the women. It's like everyone's and, having uh, fun when they, like, stab each other or there's some kind of getting high off of masturbating to violence. And it's so, it's, it's well, strange. That's, that's what, you know, it became uh, because Charlie um, adroitly seized the paranoia and isolation and um, filling their head with, uh, you know, visions of a racial war. And uh, he he screwed them up pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I think they were sort of gleeful, um, which I depicted. I mean, you hear the testimony and uh, of... Susan Atkins and uh, yeah, there's there's a. Uh, they all thought they were something special there for a while, you know. And I mean, even years after their conviction, they still floated around in this. Oh, we're all so much smarter than you are. And now, you know, and now they're all like, Oh God, I'm so sorry. Please let me out. And, you know, but so you know, it's it's they they were publicly exampled by the system and uh you know i did leslie uh van hunt get paroled though last year or so i think she finally got out um he i i think um you know she actually didn't murder anybody i mean she stabbed it's abuse of a corpse is what i'd give her because she uh (laughs) stabbed you know rosemary labianca in the uh buttocks after post-mortem so some people get really uncomfortable when it's like violence and porn together like it seems to me those are like the two powerful things that makes a movie offensive or restricted or ever if it gets nc-17 but at the same well, you time say it. Porn, you say porn and i <laughs> don't accept that it's not pornography what i did um i show sex but it's not penetration it's not you know and your goofy music in the background. <laughs> I, I love that. Speaking of switching it. Yeah, okay. But thinking of music, uh, I know you did work for Skinny Puppy. Um, are you close with yeah. them or? Um, not so much anymore. I mean, you know, I've run into uh, ogre uh, conventions or, you know, wherever sometimes. And, you know, he's, he's awesome. And uh, still friendly, you know, with uh, Kevin and, uh, but you know, I haven't done any work for him since. Uh, and because it's like it download did the whole soundtrack for your film, and it seems to me that uh, there's that relation between Skinny Puppy really liking you and you giving them, you know, influence back. And it seems to me uh, that it works out. Or am I? It was a very uh, symbiotic artistic friendship. Yeah. No, I mean we our mindsets were awesome. And, uh, you know, it was just great meeting those guys in uh, the early 90s and uh, doing their music video, Spasmolytic, was one of the greatest uh, shoots uh, of my life. I mean, you know, I they treated me uh, with great respect and I had a great crew, Canadian crew, uh, working professional people. And I, you know, gave them all my storyboards and, uh, you know, build a little miniature of what I thought the set should look like. And then I show up in Vancouver and and these guys who, you know, uh, were production designers on Flesh Gordon 2 or something had recreated my set perfectly and uh, worked with a great cameraman, Danny Nowak. And uh, yeah, in just two days, we busted that thing out. And uh, I'm really proud of that piece. Too Dark Park, that album by Skinny Puppy, really goes yeah. well with uh, some... I don't know, it just seems to me the imagery and aesthetics of Skinny Puppy, especially when they dress up in these elaborate Texas Chainsaw Massacre, serial killer clothing, and there's something with the fine line between fine art and your work, and it seems to me that 
uh, would your work be ever be considered fine art? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, filmmaking itself or, you know, and filmmaking, the term has been so abused now that any sort of movie, in quotes, it's what I call movies, people make uh, features on digital, um, that's not film. You know, it's a, don't tell me you were out filming or, you know, you were out fucking shooting digital, you idiot. You know, and, um, you know, don't show me your camcorder Coppola, you know, masterpiece and tell me that you're a filmmaker. Um, so maybe if enough of this shit keeps going on, uh, guys who actually shoot on film will be considered fine artists. Hmm. Who knows? You're working on a feature-length uh, horror called uh, Gator Green. Is that the one you talked about in, in Florida with the alligators? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep, the script's done. Um, we've lost two of our actors, um, unfortunately. Um, the thing I think is going to exist as that 15-minute piece and as that script and... Um, it's life in the future. It's probably going to mutate into something less political. And, um, it, cause it's really anti-war and it's, it's, uh, anti, it's the effect of war on veterans and then parlayed into a horror film. And, you know, that's, I know which way the wind's blowing <laughs> and I respect our president elect. And, um, Movies about crazy veterans isn't going to get financed same time here in the next eight years. So, <laughs> well, that's kind I'm, of I'm, the thing. I'm reshuffling my deck here. You know, that's also kind of the thing about being like uh, politically independent <laughs> is you end up like pissing off all sides. Yeah, that was true, but uh, well, I'm going with the guy I believe in, the guy I voted for, the guy who says we must respect the vets. You know, and. Uh, you know, what about a film a, like a Taxi Driver that that deals with that theme of like the crazy veteran who's alienated by society? Sure. No, I think it's legit. I think uh, they deserve to. It should be a genre. But I'm just saying, um, I see America entering a new phase of nationalism and uh, healthy, finally healthy respect for itself that's way overdue. And I don't want to get in the way of that or look like a party pooper. So. Expect, uh, I'm shifting gears and expect whatever's coming out to be, uh, uh, now, more. Now, if you were to say her. you're, um, a Nash, would you say yourself as a nationalist or is that a playful term? I I'm American. Uh, if, uh, you know, nationalism is you love your nation, then yeah, sure. But that doesn't um, include like, you know, like, like for instance, some of, especially in white nationalism, there is some anti-Semitic. Uh, aspect oh, to that. Oh, fuck all that. I have no time for bigotry of any type or supremacy of any type. Yeah. We're all Americans, and as Trump's saying, it's time that we unify. Yeah. It's uh, the left who specializes in putting us in boxes and saying, you're black, you're white, you know, you're gay, you're, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, these people then all march in their little groups, and everybody acts like they're not part of the big american fabric which they are it's ridiculous yeah i mean like with the separation of feminism and like you said black lives matter it seems to me you can only yeah, be no, successful just, uh, please yeah what's what's the end game you know what are yeah. they going for you know nobody wants to Kill join us it's like nobody yeah. wants to, you know, like people are like, oh, I have a problem. I'm different. Uh, I have a problem with the system, yet the system advocates them being like this transgendered queer thing, which seems to me like a role playing act rather than of a, a an identity. It seems to me people deliberately want to be opposite or different from then just being healthy and normal. It sure. Seems. And instead of going, uh, you know, once you get your head on straight and snap out of it, they encourage. It's like, oh, here's your special bathroom. <laughs> you know, that doesn't help the problem, which I think in that case is mental illness, but that's my own opinion. So with that uh, film, you still plan on making it? You just, just without the political theme, like just purely as like a horror film? Well, I mean, I, I, 
you know, throwing myself into it full bore, which I did, and I really tried to get it off the ground for the last two years. Um, but I think the script's too political. I think it's, uh, well, it's obviously too dark for anybody that I'm trying to get to fund it right now. But, I mean, in the course of making that 15-minute uh, teaser, you know, I worked with real gators and, uh, you know, the gator people down here and stuff, and I just, I'm fascinated with it. And we're, you know, it's just, uh, it's ripe subject matter and to do it with real gators not cgi not some mechanical fucking prop from a tarzan movie you know um there's a there's a lot to explore there so i'm gonna put it on the shelf and actually um i'm uh, getting ready to move back up to ohio for a little while and um i may Really uh, trying to invest myself into um, um, making another action film, I think. I think I'm of that age now. I just turned 52. And at this time in a man's life, uh, you feel like, uh, I really want to get into tip-top shape one more time. What do you want? So uh... I treat my body right, and then I can start smoking and drinking again when <laughs> I'm 58. <laughs> You know, or some shit like that. What do you think about all these, like, IFC films or Wes Anderson films where it's not about action and it's just about people in upper class society having drama or romance comedies? It seems to me that's in every single independent upper class film where it's just, <laughs> you know, it seems yeah, to be like yeah, when yeah. he met, like, any Wes Anderson film. It seems to me those are the films yeah, that yeah. are, but compared to your films, are action and almost classical in a sense that you're trying to revive this old culture. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I fall asleep at those films. I mean, I understand why they exist, and um, I certainly think it's healthy for that genre to be there. And and God knows, you know, I I love that kind of stuff myself uh, if it's not done by Wes Anderson. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm, I like Woody Allen films, uh, Robert Altman films. Um, you know, he... he Do you know of... Uh... like... Do you know of Greg Araki? I know of him. I've never met him. Oh yeah, he, you know the Doom Generation and some of. I yeah, remember right. really liking his uh, films when I was uh, like really young, and uh, I don't know. I just like the there's that there's that punk aesthetic in his films, and but he does flirt with the whole queer gay identity thing. But it's like once again, it's like kind of a pulp in that nineties uh, eighties era. You know, it's it's funny because mm-hmm. I feel like that's an extension of what's an extension of what? No, I, I just find it um, like if Rocky was um, into the whole, you know, queer underground and like of punk culture, it seems to me that um, his film, especially for, you know, mainstream audiences, he takes that to, you know, and cons- consumerifies, you know, for a consumer audience or at least flirts right. yeah. with some kind of, uh, you know, he doesn't, you know, and that's what makes him have a following is that it seems, uh, Araki is, uh, you know, talking about things such as, you know, uh, hardcore punks and their freedom and some flirtation with that. Um, we always bring this up, but with the same one, we're talking about Larry Clark's film, Kids or Ken Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, um, wish these guys all the success in the world it's good to have fresh um untainted uh uh voices out there you know and these guys are obviously trying to uh, they, they've got some sort of an agenda and i mean you know that's the thing i miss about the art house culture i mean you know uh through the 90s and Early 2000s, I mean, art houses were still around in America, art house cinemas. You know, there was one in every medium and big town. And uh, that's where you would see the Iraqi films or the Larry Clark films or John Waters or uh, John Sayles or uh, Jim Jarmusch or uh, Linkletter, you know. and And I mean, that whole culture is gone. Nobody makes films for medium-sized budget. What Hollywood calls medium-sized budget, you know, two to eight million. So and if you want to no, see like an independent no platform, 
yeah, I would to... like to see a rebirth of that, of you know, good independent filmmakers actually having a market to show their stuff at. You know, I mean, because that's between uh, fucking the internet and uh, torrent sites and. Just oh man, the marketplace is in a horrible place. You know, if you if you want to try and make any money, it seems like I mean, the John internet. Waters hasn't. John Waters hasn't made a film in fucking years, right? Or <laughs> Cronenberg, or well, Cronenberg does, but um, Lynch, you know, well, he got a deal with the uh, stars on Twin Peaks, but I mean, so many guys they're, they're, they've been sitting around because uh, it's really hard to get financing, independent financing anymore. And, um, I mean, this is another reason why I was like, go Trump. Because, I mean, he will make America wealthy again. And that's what independent filmmakers who go to people and ask for fucking money to make their films, that's what I need. I need people to be wealthy again, damn it. <laughs> it seems like um, all of these films we mentioned, maybe most of the directors, unfortunately, might be, you know, Hillary supporters or maybe some kind of liberal and therefore everything should be free. And with the access to the internet, you can get anything free from torrent sites and downloads. Yeah, I where, fucking um, hate that. It killed the music industry too. Yeah, it's like yeah, so it's like ideology suits also the market. And if people I guess if there were more Trump, you know, there would be the, the, the game of working class, uh paying a business and all that respected rights. But it seems so as long as you have freedom, like, you know, these weird art house films where they can do whatever they want. It seems that falls with ideology, and then they say, oh, who cares about working? Everything should be free and for the people, and then it ends up being like self-destructive. Yeah, it sure has. Um, I knew it was going to fall of its own weight, um, and uh, yeah, I think it has. I think uh, America's really turned a corner. Um, get ready, guys, because what Trump's going to do is going to be amazing. Oh, yes, I actually hope so. You've done a lot of uh, horror films. Uh, do you have any like uh, specific horror films that are your favorite or horror directors that have influenced you? Oh, um, well, being an independent, I sure love George A. Romero. Um, just uh, from you know what he represents as an independent, and and uh, just how masterful a filmmaker and writer he is. Um, Cronenberg was great until about, I guess it started with Naked Lunch and then Butterfly, and then he just went off the fucking rails. Um, <laughs> but his early stuff was killer. I mean, Dead Ringers is fucking awesome. Uh, the Fly remake. Um, Carpenter's The Thing is great. What about a Existence um, or something with Jude Law? <laughs> yeah, that was weak. Yeah. I always say that too. So it's kind of like a video drone rehash light <laughs> sort of thing. I thought it was terrible. I saw the trailer of that with my friend, and my we didn't even know it was Cronenberg. We're like this is the most strangest film ever. <laughs> and it's just oh, I don't know. That film is controversial, but yeah, I do think I, it is one of his weakest films. Yeah, you had no, a, a horror a crime film called uh, My Sweet uh, Satan, and it's about a, a group of like a. Uh, bored a drug addicted teenagers who get involved in like a satanic occult yeah i made that you talk about the like production of that and the plot and like what gave you the kind of inspiration of it well it's based on a real uh murder case uh, this teenager ricky casso from uh, northport new york um murdered uh this kid gary lars and uh, with his uh, uh, his friend Jimmy Toriano, and uh, but I mean Ricky's the one who did the the business. But it's um, and you actually it, acted in this uh, as Ricky. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What I did was updated from um, you know I mean the case happened in the early '80s, and I made it in the early '90s, and. Um, I was taking a break from Manson, which was going on forever, and we were stalling out in our fundraising. And so I wanted to make something short that would just wow investors instead of showing them all these half-cut-together scenes, just a complete piece. And so um, I raised, uh, I don't know, what was it, 
six grand or something. We made that in like no time. Nobody got paid, but you know, it was just, it was pure. Ah, we're getting to make something from stem to stern from start to finish without years of waiting, you know? And so, um, yeah, I threw myself into it. And like I said, uh, the kids around Dayton were doing, uh, you know, all of a sudden tattoos were the norm and they were all into heroin and, uh, piercing and, you know, crazy haircuts. And I said, well, I'm going to represent this. And I was 28 at the time. And I knew it was the last time I could play off or pull off playing young, you know, so I just went for it. And you also worked on a horror film, American Guinea Pig, a bouquet of guts and gore. And this yeah, came out a few years it. ago. Yeah, I shot it. So this is about a, a two women who were abducted and brought into this uh, like hellish <laughs> nightmare. I, I haven't seen it, but does it yeah, take well, place? Does it yeah, take place yeah, like yeah. in another dimension or in this? No, no, it's it's just it's like what you're watching is almost like raw snuff film. I mean, that was the vibe. Um, Stephen Byro, the director writer, just wanted it to be look like raw snuff and. You know, um, I convinced him to shoot on film and, uh, you know, I shot it. I mean, he had another camera going at VHS that's intercut with the film. I think that's a terrible editorial idea, but it's his movie. So, yeah, it's just a gritty, there was no plot. I mean, it's just snuff. It's just these two women get shot up with a drug so they're immobilized but awake and they get ripped apart on screen i mean the start of the show is these special effects and then i just went for a look that um i took from uh roger Watkins, um uh, his last house on dead end street that gritty uh, just blacks you know um a void in the background while they cut up that woman on that table and I that that scene was just in my brain when I I shot it and I think it definitely puts you in mind of that but anyway Stephen's a good guy he's uh he's often driving to Los Angeles to make his fortune right now um, speaking of which um there was a, a documentary about you a uh, diary of a deadbeat and uh, that was mm -hmm. kind of your film about you and from what I watched from the trailer, I haven't seen it. It seems to me that there, you definitely have a, a huge following or that there is some kind of uh, cult aesthetic to your work. And um, how, how do you, tr like if somebody was to cross the street and they would say, oh, I know who you are. Uh, can I have your autograph? Would you, uh, ha do you like your fans? <laughs> sure, I appreciate them. Of course I do. Um I don't go out of my way to seek them out. I'm not, um, my idea of torture is like going to a convention and sitting behind a table and taking people's money for a picture or something. I mean, that just drives me ape shit. But um, I've done it now and then. I mean, you got to, you know, you got to touch base with the, the people who like your work. And uh, I certainly am appreciative of that. Are the... I have no... Are the people signing autographs? It's just uh, strikes me odd sometimes. You know, do the people that like your work are they like weirdos or disturbed criminals? And uh, what are <laughs> no? Have you met them before? No. Okay. Yeah. Um. You know, I mean, not not on the whole. Let me say that most of them are very nice. Um, Well-adjusted people with regular jobs who just like crazy movies. Now, of course, given the subject matter, you are going to, if you cross this country from north to south and east to west, you're going to run into a handful of people who have totally wrong ideas about why you make the movies you make, and uh, they seem to have a lot of mental problems. And fortunately for me, uh, nothing has come out of it. I did have a guy, after we premiered Manson in Chicago, um, we went to a bar, uh, um, you know, after the screening and 
there was this big, huge dude, six, seven or something, you know, I mean, just monster staring at us and uh, giving me the, you know, just the I'm going to kill you face. And um, some people went over and talked to him and then they come back and they're like, maybe Jim, you ought to get out of here. That guy says he's here to kill you. <laughs> and I said, what the fuck? <laughs> and so I went up to him and I said, hey, man, let me buy you a drink. And uh, we went to the bar, and, and I just started talking to him. I didn't even let him get the offensive. And I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, uh, just with, by being easy going around him, I calmed him down. He finished his drink, and he looked at me and said, I came here to kill you. But after talking to you, I'm not going to do that. You're a good guy. So how about <laughs> that shit? Yeah, that sounds That's something. true story, man. That's, that's, I mean, I don't know, you know, the, the guy could just be saying that, you know, but whatever. Do, do you have any, <laughs> do you have any girl, you ever, do you have any like, girl uh, fans or something or women that love your picks? Quite a few. That's what I would imagine. What they, what are they like? Um, adventurous women, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> sexy okay. women, you know, they, they're, they not afraid to say they like, uh, dark films you know your next film you said you want to make a action film is this going to be kind of uh one of dealing with a lot of these uh, really violent uh dark themes or just more of a like a more mainstream action film uh, it is, i there's nothing about what i make that's ever mainstream it seems somehow you know and uh, um so it won't be you know some ready for uh, you know uh, the studios. Um, it's gonna probably have to be independently financed. It'll be gritty. It'll be tough. The violence and action will be like dead beat at dawn. Um, you know, basically, it's it's a good reason for me to quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, we about wrapped up. Okay. Uh, Jim uh, Van Beber, it's uh, been an excellent show. Uh, thanks for being on. Sure, my pleasure, guys. And also, uh, thanks, uh, Pill Eater. Nice talking to you, Jim. Have a good day. Yeah, have a great night. Have a good weekend. You too. All right, see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.